and welcome to the Multicultural AFL Football Show. I am Vanessa Gatica and with me to talk about all things AFL footy, I'm joined by my two co-panelists who also come from diverse ethnic backgrounds, Javier Sincan and Gabriel D'Angelo. Hello guys. Hello. Last Friday night, we saw the first semi-final between Houghton and Melbourne at the MCG. Melbourne ran away winners in an impressive display of power football, 104 to 71. And on Saturday night, the second semi-final between Collingwood and GWS at the MCG, where the Magpies ended the Giants' finals campaign by 10 points. The final score, 69 to 59. So a steam roll and a close results because the Magpies couldn't kick straight. Guys, what is your selection of game of the weekend? For me, it will be um, the game between Melbourne um, and the Hawks. That, because there was, um, there were two Victorian teams, although uh, Hawks come from Tasmania, but still um, both the teams are very uh, used to playing at uh, MCG. So it was a close contest. There was no like interstate factor or the, uh, you can say uh, the crowd factor or anything like that. And the way the Melbourne played, it was just awesome. Um, they didn't let uh, Hawks play their normal precision game, the short pass game. They just, uh, whenever they tried, they sort of, uh, they, they got them back. And uh, they'll be ruining their chances as well, the way uh, although Jack Gunston had a very good time, but he, he, that was a costly miss and that sort of changed the momentum. I believe that was a turning point for them. And Hawks didn't wilt under pressure aside, they kept coming back. So in that way, the game was very good. But uh, Melbourne, in the end, had all the answers. And how good was Jack Whining? I mean, he played fantastic uh, in that game, a as if the break didn't have uh, any effect on him, uh, negative was. It was all positive for him and he came back all prepared. And so it, all, the, all those guys, they did a immaculate job uh, in, against the Hawks. And Max gone, he, he's just cool and calm mm. um, over there. It doesn't matter, nothing affects him, no push or shove, nothing affects him. He knows his job and he just finishes it off. The way Melbourne are playing at the moment, all those guys sticking together and they know they can go uh, to the finals, to the grand final even. So they're gelling together well. I said that was a treat to watch, especially against the Hawks. So that was the game of the week for me. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I thought that the Melbourne Hawthorne game was the game of the round and Melbourne, they were just playing the way that I was expecting them to. They were just so sharp, so clinical, just so clean. The way they were just going about it, it was, it was fantastic. But the good thing about Melbourne's performance was they didn't choke. They didn't get into a panic, they didn't get nervous, they weren't overawed, especially when Hawthorne started to catch up a little bit. When Hawthorne started to score a few unanswered goals in the early terms of the last quarter, they weren't in a panic. They were just calm, they just said, OK, we've got this, we'll get the ball back, we'll start playing, and then they started to score and start to set the agenda of the game again. And that was really impressive because the old Melbourne wouldn't have done that. The old Melbourne would have let Hawthorne overrun them and they would have won the game. But this is a new Melbourne, new attitude, new players, new mentality. I just love seeing the likes of Petrarca, Brayshaw, Oliver, Gorn, uh, Wiedemann. They're all playing such great footy at the moment. That's just to name a few because they're just playing so well at the moment. I think that the finals are bringing out the best in these players. Mm -hmm. They're not nervous about it. They're not overawed. They're not daunted at the fact that they're playing against players who are extremely experienced in this sort of setting. That they're, they're totally okay with that, which is really, really good. Melbourne really have a good team for the future, I think. And um, if they go on to beat West Coast in Perth, there are some errors that they made against Hawthorne that they can't do against West Coast at Optus Stadium. But I'm pretty sure we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. Yeah, and I believe there was a divine intervention as well uh, because the same thing happened in this match which happened in the last match against Geelong where uh, Selwood gives them a free kick when Tom Hawkins was about to kick and the same thing ha happened this time as well. Tom Mitchell gave it a free kick. So there, there is some sort of divine forces behind Melbourne as well. <laughs> so yeah, It's a fairy tale. Fairy tale, yeah. Fairy tale. <laughs> Good comment, Fabio. Thank you. Uh, I think for me, my pick is calling good against GWS because I think the, the game was very tough, was uh, lots of pressure and was very close game. So I really enjoyed that game. Now it's time for the six rapid fire AFL Q and A. After Melbourne's emphatic victory against the Hawks, should Adam Simpson's men be worried about this? Well, yes, um, definitely, um, because 
Melbourne has shown them what they can do um, in that uh, round match as well. Although he can argue a few points that we missed out this one, we didn't have to play, but didn't have a few players which uh, should have been there. But Melbourne uh, has been great this season. The way they're playing at the moment, the fast footy they're playing, it needs to be stopped if uh, Simpson wants to have some chance of his team to win. So he needs to come up with some ideas. But definitely he needs to be worried because Melbourne is coming and they're coming red hot. Yeah. Thank you, Javier. Gabriel, once again the GWS Ferrari has crashed. Should the Giants panic about another wasted season or can they rebuild for a better 2019? Well, like I said last time, they're less a Ferrari and more of a Datsun 120Y and, and not just any <laughs> Datsun, a Datsun that they found on Gumtree or that they bought <laughs> secondhand at Car City because really they, they should have done better than this GWS and it, it might seem a little bit overly harsh or overly critical but the reality is that Collingwood should have beaten GWS by much, much more. Mm. They really should have been at least 50 points ahead at halftime if they weren't so wasteful in yes. front of goals. Because in reality, GWS only lost by 10 points and they were only in it only because of Collingwood's inaccuracy in front of goal. Um, that's really about it in terms of GWS's chance against Collingwood. But as in terms of a rebuild, look, uh, Dylan Shield, I think he wants to come back to Victoria. Griffin has just retired. They've got some very good young players at their disposal with the money they've got, with the talent, with the players and the facilities they've got. GWS really should have had the week off. They should have been preparing for a preliminary final, not trying to win to get into it. So would this be the beginning of a decline? I don't know. It's t time will tell, but um, we'll see. But they've got the talent to bounce back. Back to you, Javier. Jarek Pollock has requested a trade to North Melbourne. Will this happen? And if it does, would his arrival at Arden Street bolster the Roos' chances of making the finals next year? I'll come to the first part later of Jared Pollock, but I believe North Melbourne, the way they played this season, I'm quite sure they should be able to make it uh, next season, even without Jared Pollock. Um, but add Jared Pollock into that with Sean Higgins, uh, Ben Cunnington, Ben Brown at, um, at the front, I believe they, they will be very strong contenders. So. I have got no doubt uh, that if Jared Pollock moves in, it's definitely going to uh, uh, make their midfield much better and they'll be able to um, make more mark on every game. So I believe, yes, uh, it will help uh, North Melbourne and they will be in the finals. Thank you, Javier. Gabriel, it seems that Dan Haneberry could be making his way to the Science next season. Is his arrival what the Science need or do they need a new coach to move forward? What St Kilda need more than anything isn't new players, it's a new coach. Look, Dan Hanabry is a fantastic player. He's given a lot of years of service to the Sydney Swans, but he's not at his prime, he's not at his peak, and he is starting to be a little bit injury prone. So, look, I, I want him to be real of good value to St Kilda, but I don't know if he will be, if his body will be right and able to get St Kilda going where they want to go. And in reality, what's the point of having new players come in when there's no game plan? It, it doesn't look like St Kilda have a real structure or a real game plan sitting in place. So if anything, it's not what's on the field that really matters, it's off it as well. The technical standpoint has to change at St Kilda in order for them to really improve and to really go somewhere uh, next season. Look, I think Dan Hannanbury's a good player and all that. I hope he can revitalise his career and revitalise himself and have a good time at St Kilda, but I think more than anything, it's, it's the coaching that needs to change because some players are getting gradually worse. Some of the skills, skill levels uh, during games are not of an elite AFL standard. So we'll wait and see, but hopefully he can do well. But I'm just a little bit pessimistic. Andrew Gaff has come out saying he wants to stay at the West Coast. Will he stay or will he make his way to Victoria through the trade period in 2019? Well, I tend to believe him at this stage because he hasn't shown any sort of um, indications that he wants to move out. Normally, sometimes you see those indications if, if a player wants to stay or not, but he hasn't shown any. And plus, um, when that incident happened, the way Simpson went around him and all the other players, and I believe all the fans, the way they supported him, uh, I don't think he, he would have many reasons to come back um, and play for Victoria. But uh, having said that, um, uh, Duff on his podcast, he mentioned that his uh, father 
uh, might not be well. So that could be a reason for him to moving here as well. And he can um, he. He can see the flag coming to West Coast as well, the way the mm. way they're playing at mm. the moment. So I don't really see any reason for him to move. Mm. Uh, so I believe he might make a short contract. I don't, I don't know if he's getting very good offers from Victoria. But I believe at this stage, after the incident, the kind of sport he's getting at West Coast, I think it will make it harder for him to move up. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And finally, Gabriel, much has been said about Toby Green's use of his legs when he goes up to take a mark. Is the criticism of his technique justified or is it much ado about nothing? Yes, it's totally justified. I think the way he kicks out... Really? Yes, absolutely. Because the way he kicks out, he could really seriously hurt someone. In fact, he, he did. He uh, hit uh, Luke Dalhouse from the Bulldogs in the face and, and he was out for a few weeks because of it. And during the game against Sydney, when he was doing that like four or five times during the game, he hit quite a few of the Sydney players in the chest or in the stomach. He hit mm -hmm. Alia Alia uh, in the shoulder at one point. And, you know, if, if someone gets hit in the face or even gets a stud in the eye, they could lose an eye. They could get some really serious damage because of those kicks, those, the way that he kicks out when he's marking the ball. Because the way he's coming in, someone is about to contest the ball. So he knows someone is coming, someone yeah. is after him. So there's that. But I also think that the umpires are just as bad they're just as responsible for this because during that game against Sydney, he was doing it over and over and over again and the umpires were just allowing this to happen. They should have known. They should have stopped in, stepped in and said, okay, look, we'll give you this one mark, but that's it because you can seriously hurt someone. So they're just as bad and they're just as responsible for his actions as Toby Green is. Yeah. If I may add, um, is this the footy we want to show our kids? Is this how they want... Uh, is this how we want our kids to play at the, at the junior level aside, like kicking each other and then trying uh, inculcating kung fu into uh, footy? Uh, I mean, that's, that needs to be stopped, according to me as well. Well, that's it for now. We will return after the break with what's happening to AFR rules next year and more on the Multicultural Football Show, so stick around. Welcome back to the second half of the program. You are watching the Multicultural AFL Football Show, and we are now at the AFL Preliminary Final. First up on Friday night at 7.50 Eastern Standard Time at the MCG is the preliminary final between the Tigers and the Pies. This is a sellout game with many rabid fans from both sides making their way to a packed MCG. Javier, a tough contest. Can Richmond beat Collingwood and take a step closer for back-to-back -back flags? I believe they can, um, the way they're playing at the moment. Um, a lot will depend how they've taken that break. Has it made them rusty or is it like they've still got that what they had uh, to beat everyone at MCG this year? So if they still got it, uh, Collingwood um, doesn't stand a chance. But having said that, uh, in the last match, um, Collingwood was very close. And the way they played um, their midfield, it, they, they were right up to Richmond. So I, they, there's going to be a big contest, but Collingwood needs to play a four-quarter game. They can't just, uh, uh, against, uh, against Richmond, they can't play a one-quarter, two-quarter, or three-quarter game. They have to be up there, matching up to them for the four quarters. Although they, there's a thing that since 1937 or so, they, uh, they haven't beaten um, Richmond in the finals, which is, a, which is a stat that sort of goes against Pies. But this year, um, they, they are in. They, the way they are at the moment, from what, where they were last year and where they are now, I believe that's a huge improvement and there's nothing uh, stopping them with the kind of uh, players they got at the moment. So I believe uh, Richmond do have an edge on them. My tip would be Richmond for this one, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if Collywood can pull an upset. Yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely agree. I think that Richmond will win, but um, having seen Collingwood play against Richmond last time, that Collingwood, they were toe-to-toe -to -toe with Richmond for quite, you know, quite a long period of the game. They weren't that far off of them. In fact, I remember that a lot of the players were out missing, a lot of their key men were out injured, and some players did get injured during the game, and then eventually they sort of ran out of puff. But they were close to Richmond for the majority of the game, which is a great sign for uh, Collingwood fans because it means that they're not far off from the, from the, the pedestal, from the main mark that is Richmond because you know, they are the, the trend-setting team. But if Collingwood 
don't make the same mistakes they did against GWS, I think that they're well within a chance of actually winning this game. They can't do the same mistakes that they did against GWS, against Richmond. No way, because Richmond will eat them alive. If Collingwood have the opportunities to score, they have to make sure it's a six-pointer. They can't miss against Richmond. Um, having said that, you know, players like uh, De Goy, who's he's an absolute gun, uh, Varco, who's just been amazing after what is a, a very tragic personal circumstances, uh, Grundy, Jeremy Howe, some fantastic talent and one of the best players, uh, or one of the most underrated players in the AFL, for me anyway, uh, still side bottom. I think he's just a sensational player. So if they've got all those factors right, Collingwood could cause an upset. I don't think they will. I think Richmond will win and they'll go back to back after this one. Yeah, um, on that note, because we've upset some Collingwood fans here by tipping for Richmond, <laughs> there's a good stat to cheer you up. Mm -hmm. uh, when Richmond won uh, their premiership a year before, they were at number 13 on the ladder and they got into top four and the Collingwood has done the same. They were number 13 last year and this year they, they were in the top four. So there's something to look forward for you Collingwood uh, supporters. I know I will enjoy watching this Titanic struggle, actually. I think the game goes into extra time, boys. I think it could be possible. And it could be anybody's game. Well, uh, I, I believe, as we said before, it, there is there's not much uh, which sort of differentiate these, these two teams at the moment. They're both um, good in the midfield. They've both got good forwards. They both, I mean, um, with, with the defence-wise, I mean, uh, that's... Gold, uh, Tyson Goldsack is him coming back. That was a big plus, I believe, that the way he played uh, in the last game. So uh, that, so it's they, they are sort of at par with each other. Although Collingwood has the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Richmond has the edge over Collingwood the way they're mm. playing. But I believe, yeah, it's it might if it go into extra time, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. Well, j just to reiterate for the Collingwood supporters out there, um, we're not tipping against them because we think they're terrible. On the contrary, they're a very good side, but. Richmond are just so good and they've been so good for so long yes. that it's impossible to tip against them, really. But I, I, I really do think that Collingwood would have a very good shot if all the elements are right. They could cause an upset, but I don't think so. Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> Moving right along to the second preliminary final on Saturday 1.20 p.m. Western Standard Time at Optus Stadium in Perth. It is the West Coast Eagles hosting a home final against the Melbourne Demons. Can the Demons cause an upset or it is too far for the young Melbourne side, Gary? Absolutely. I mean, Demon, Demons supporters haven't been this excited since the Liberal Party won the last state election. I mean, they have just, and they've got every right to be excited because mm. Melbourne are playing some really good footy at the moment. Yes. They are just going so strong. They lost the last two games against Geelong by a very narrow margin and then they beat them in the final. They got smashed in round four against Hawthorne and then they beat them in the final. In round 22, they beat West Coast in Perth. Can they win? Who knows? Maybe. But I think that the great thing about Melbourne is that they're not afraid. They're not scared. They're not afraid of anyone. They're not nervous and not daunted about the occasion. They've just recently beaten two extremely good teams who are consistently in the top eight, who are consistently premiership favourites in Geelong and Hawthorne. So going into this game against another good team who is also another premiership contender who's also consistently in the top eight it's not going to scare them and I think that they know that and I think that West Coast knows that too because they know very well that Melbourne they've got their tails up they're going to come into this game into into a ground which they won last time so I think that they're going to have that in the back of their mind and in reality their last game against Collingwood Collingwood should have won that game if it wasn't for some bad umpiring and a little bit of misses here and there, Collingwood could have actually won that game against West Coast. So it's not exactly impossible for Melbourne to win. I actually think they can win. Whether they can go on to, to win the flag, I don't know. But I think that Melbourne can actually beat West Coast in this one. Well, um, they definitely can beat West Coast. No doubt about that. The, and the type of footy they're playing, the fast footy they're playing. They're, um, as we mentioned before, the way they're gelling together as a team, they, they know their jobs so, and they, they're sticking to it and they're performing those jobs very well. So um, 
West Coast got a, a big, uh, big game on their hand uh, at the moment. Although uh, there's a big factor that Jack Darling and Josh Kennedy didn't play last time when they were mm. playing. And I believe Mitch McGowan and Tom Brass, they, they were not up to their standard in the last game. And uh, they, uh, they, they'll be ruining their chances that what they did against Melbourne in the last game. So they will come up with a plan. Um, mm. We know that they're such a good players, especially if they're playing at, uh, at Perth. To me, uh, I believe Melbourne can win, but will they? That's a different story. Uh, I believe Adam Simpson's um, players would be there um, to take them on, and they will have a plan in place. Uh, and with the crowd behind their back, they, mm. uh, I believe they should, um, they should be able to beat Melbourne. But even if Melbourne wins, it wouldn't be a big surprise, but I believe uh, West Coast should win this one yeah. and end the Cinderella story. Well, we'll see, but I think that Melbourne more than anything in their game last week, which they need to improve on in this game against West Coast, is their passing. Some of their passing was a little bit wayward. Mm -hmm. There were times where Hawthorne would attack, Melbourne's defence would get it, they'll boot it back out, and the Hawthorne player would get it back, boot it back into the forward line, and the Melbourne player would get it, and would just go back and forth like that. So Melbourne need to be a little bit more precise in their passing. And if they can, if they can do that, then I think that they've got a good shot of winning this game because once they start scoring goals and once they start getting passes together and taking real advantage and setting the agenda of the game, I think that they'll uh, silence the crowd and really scare the, the Eagles. There, there are interesting observations and comments, guys. But for me, I'm tipping Melbourne as well for because I think they are in the best shape in 12 years. So they have playing the best footy and I think th they deserve being in the finals and may, why not maybe mm -hmm. win? Mm -hmm. Here is a question for you, boys. Before we finish another episode of the Multicultural Football Show, the AFL is proposing to make rule changes for the next season by having the 666 players starting position for center bounces and 18 meter, meter long goal square. Will these alterations improve the game or is it all very unnecessary, Javier? Well, whether it will improve the game or not, we will see later on. But all the way I see it is it's going to be more of a midfield game. It is already a midfielder's game with uh, them winning all the brown lows and making a big impact on the team, um, getting the votes from the umpires. But uh, what they will do um, at this point, like if, if you've got a good midfielder like Petri, Dangerfield, Cripps, or uh, to mention maybe Ablett if, if he's playing next season as well. So they, they will find it very easy to get the ball uh, to the 50 and then that, that will be uh, very advantageous to them. And with the 18 meter arc, I believe um, what's gonna happen is uh, what used to happen in the old times that the ball was kicked all uh, way forward in, into the halves. Th that's what's gonna happen. And I believe it, with the congestion issue that all the talk is about, whether it will impact in that manner or not, that's, I, I know that they've trialed it and everything. I believe we, we will see when it comes to the actual game because VFL games where they trialed it and where they did it, I'm, I'm not really sure whether they were actually um, good grounds for experimentation. But we will see uh, what happens next year. But uh, my view is um, they're changing too many rules um, and they, they're doing very quick. And the way, uh, the impression that they're giving at the moment is like th there is something really wrong with the game and we need to work on it. To me, it's like the rules that they've got at the moment, they need to be um, made sure that they're followed properly. And umpires, they got um, they got a better view as well. So I, to me, the, the too many rules are happening, but let's see what happens next year. Yeah, uh, I'm not too enamored with the rule changes either. I don't understand why there should be so many rule changes, especially seeing as they're not exactly necessary. Um, these sorts of changes, I, I don't see it impacting the game in any profound or any sort of positive way. I don't think it's gonna enhance the game in any way, shape mm. or form. I, I just don't understand why they do it. I can, I can see the AFL's point of view in different terms, in terms of tackling and head high challenges and all that because we're dealing with concussions and spinal injuries and, and just people's health. I can understand that, but these sorts of rule changes, I just don't understand. I think it's unnecessary. If anything, there should be uh, rule changes to the draft system. I think that they're going to have a mid-season draft, which I think would be um, interesting to see. I think they'll help a lot, but the current draft system that they have at the moment, I'm not particularly happy with that either. I think that needs to be overhauled and changed because a lot of the mediocre or not so good mm -hmm. clubs 
get rewarded by having the best picks of the young talent that's coming up. And a lot of these young players, though, they, they're not going to spend five or ten years of their footballing career at a team trying to rebuild it. They're going to go to a, a decent club like Richmond or Hawthorne or, or West Coast or these teams that are going to compete year after year for a premiership. So this equalisation of the draft hasn't worked out as well. So I think they need to fix more along the lines of what's happening off the field rather than on it, I think. Now just a reminder of those who are new to the footy. The winners of the two preliminary finals will face each other in the grand final. The losers, unfortunately, go into mod balls until next year. The winner of the grand final will become the premiers of the AFL. Who will that be? Until next time, when we will be a step closer to the answer. That's all for this week's edition to the Multicultural Football Show. Don't forget to listen to us on 33% FM and online at the NENBC's AFL footy website. Stay tuned next week for our last footy show of the year, where we will preview the grand final and all things AFL multicultural footy. I am Vanessa Gatica. I'm Herbie Singh. I'm Gabriel D'Angelo. Thank you for watching. May you team win. Bye for now. Let me hear you say.